address today is alienation. And let me right at the outset define what I mean by alienation. It's the cry of men who feel themselves the victims of blind economic forces beyond their control. It's the frustration of the great mass of ordinary people excluded from the processes of decision making. It's the feeling of despair and hopelessness that pervades people who feel with every justification that they have no real say in shaping or determining their own destinies. If automation and technology is accompanied as it must be with full employment, then the leisure time available to man will be enormously increased. This being so, then our whole concept of education must change. The object must be to equip and educate people for life, not for work. Hi, everyone. Today marks 49 years to the day since Jimmy Reed's famous speech as rector of Glasgow University. The speech was heralded as one of the greatest in the modern era and with its talk of automation, alienation and an irrational economic system, its message still resonates strongly today. Here at Contour, we think it's important to remember our political traditions as we head into possibly the most important election in the history of the Scottish Parliament. My name's Kat Boyd and welcome to this week's episode of Contour Live, your sceptical guide to the Scottish election. With just a week to go, Contour Live will be here uh, next Wednesday and the Wednesday after the election, letting you talk to some of Scotland's sharpest thinkers about the big issues that will shape our future on and after that day, May 6th. Before I introduce our guest tonight, let me just take a second to say that we at Contour are entirely supported by word of mouth and your generosity. So if you can, take a second to help others find us by liking and subscribing to everything by Contour and Independence Live who are helping us with this production. You can find us at contour.co.uk and if you're feeling extra generous, please back independent media by giving us a small monthly donation. This week has seen more scandals rock Downing Street with Boris Johnson allegedly speaking of, quote, letting bodies pile up rather than contemplate a third lockdown. And there's mounting questions surrounding the money for his flat redecoration and the continuing revolving door between the conservative governments and big business. Despite denials, the Tory can't seem to keep these stories out of the headlines. But with over 100,000 people dead during coronavirus and over 3 million now unemployed, does any of this matter? Do people still care about these scandals? Meanwhile, up here, there's an election on. Last night's leaders' debate on Channel 4 didn't seem to go to plan for anyone. Nicola Sturgeon seemed exasperated by questions on independence. Douglas Ross was outed as an opponent of equal marriage. Anna Sarwar admitted his manifesto was uncosted. Patrick Harvey looked a bit weak on coalition negotiations. And Willie Rennie tagged along at the back. So who is winning at the debates in this election? Also this week, a new report cast fresh doubt on the SNP's position on NATO and Trident. Is the SNP risking another fankle over foreign policy? And will the electorate care? Joining me to make sense of some of these issues and more are firstly, Kenny McCaskill, MP for East Lothian and biographer of Jimmy Reid, and also a recent SNP defector to Alaba. We also, I think, are hopefully going to be joined by Jean Urquhart. Um, Jean's just having some connection problems at the moment. Jean was an SNP MSP and then an independent MSP for the Highlands and Islands who resigned from the SNP over the party's turn on NATO. We also are joined with Angela Haggerty, former editor of the 
former political editor of the Sunday Herald and one of Scotland's leading journalists and political commentators. And finally, we have James Foley, who many viewers will know from his daily Source Direct newsletter covering the hot topics in Scottish politics. Welcome, everyone. Hello. Hi. Hello. Hi. Um, so let's just get started. We've got uh, loads of loads of topics to try and cover this week. So I just want to go straight into um, these latest allegations of sleaze and cronyism and corruption in the Tory party um, over the last week. James, what's your take on what's happened? Well, um, it's an odd one because it seemed a few years ago that the Tories were out of some of the hot water that they'd been experiencing. The vaccination process, like it or not, was starting to go relatively well. They had a significant lead uh, over the Labour Party going into some crucial local elections. And then it's all just started to go uh, pear-shaped uh, for the Conservatives um, in the last couple of weeks, starting with the Greensill uh, scandal, which kind of exposed the revolving door, particularly between the Conservative Party and big business, uh, but more generally between government and big business at Westminster. Um, following up on that, we had the so-called cash for curtains uh, scandal, where um, uh, Boris Johnson and his partner were alleged to have uh, solicited donations to pay for some refurbishments um, of their home. Um, and there's been a number of questions raised around that, which are still ongoing and may be investigated by the Electoral Commission. And then probably most damagingly of all, uh, there's been the suggestions of um, around the COVID uh, management, particularly surrounding uh, the, um, the third lockdown with a suggestion that Boris Johnson uh, torpedoed an investigation into someone who had leaked details of the third lockdown uh, because they were a friend of his partner. And then probably most damagingly um, of all, as you said at the beginning, Kat, this uh, let bodies pile up um, comment, which is alleged to have been made, has uh, been probably particularly um, brutal and has kind of raised the question which seemed to have gone away of the inhumane nature of the Conservative response to the coronavirus. Um, I mean, obviously, if you go back to the concepts of herd immunity and so on, back at the initial phase of the um, of the coronavirus crisis, for a long time there was a massive perception of inhumanity surrounding the Conservative response. So all these things kind of reinforce, I suppose, what a lot of us up here think that we already know, which is that the Conservatives in Westminster and so on, there's a deep level of corruption, uh, there's dehumanising policies and, uh, and an attitude towards particularly poor people and so on. Then again, I guess the question that emerges is whether the old perception that our politics is whiter than white and Westminster's is corrupt is particularly valid um, after some of the scandals that we've seen in Scottish politics I, as well. I'd just like to... Um come in on that because this is, um, Angela, I'm going to come to you next because this is often being posed as a Westminster problem, um, the toadies down there and that, that, that sort of thing. Um, but we have seen, although the Scottish government have not had the same type of inhumanity, it would be ridiculous to, to say that they have around coronavirus that the, the Tories um, have been guilty of. We have seen some allegations of cronyism in Scotland too. So that I'm thinking, for example, the minutes of meetings with China regarding BIFAB um, not being entirely recorded, Fergus Ewing's meetings with uh, Gupta and Greensill of the books. And that's before we get into some of the relationships between our government and uh, lobbying firms. So, I mean, is the problem of cronyism and the revolving door um, just as important for Scotland as Westminster. Yeah, well, first of all, um, can I just apologise for the background here? I've been relegated to the spare room uh, while my son watches cartoons in the living room. I'll see if I can get any Tory donors to help me redecorate. <laughs> <laughs> Um, yeah, I mean, I, I think that there is definitely an issue in Scotland. One, one of the, it, it, it's lobbying, I think, in Scotland. Um, and there's one 
firm that stands out for me. Now, people might have heard the name of it, you might not. Charlotte Street Partners, right? This is a really prime example of how we need more transparency in government. So basically, um, Charlotte Street Partners is a lobbying firm. Its, uh, it's chair and I think founder is, is Sir Angus Grossart, who people may remember the name because he's the person who inf infamously invited Steve Bannon to Scotland. Um, and basically, they, they are very secretive about who their clients are. So who they're lobbying on behalf of, we don't entirely know. But what we do know is that it's not been unheard of for people who've been quite senior within the SNP or within the government um, to then you know, quit that role and go straight over to a role in the private sector with Charlotte Street Partners. So they have the ear of government, you know, they have the ear of all those senior figures. Uh, and there's definitely a question mark over whether that's appropriate. Sure, if you've been working in the public sector, you might want to go into the private sector at some point. But to do that immediately, uh, and for a firm where we don't know an awful lot about what it is that they're doing, um, I think if we were to find out who those clients were and then perhaps look at decisions that have been made by government, would we discover that there looks like there could have been any favours there? We need transparency. Um, and there is also this case of, uh, it's been several times now where the Scottish government's been caught with you know ministers having meetings about some policy area or, or other and no minutes having been taken. And that that you know this is <laughs> how can you have anything released by freedom of information if it does the information hasn't been recorded? So it's a way of kind of um, swerving that, and that's worrying. Government should not be doing that. Government needs to be transparent, and everything needs to be recorded so that we we can scrutinise all this stuff. The SNP, the Scottish as the Scottish government gets away with a law. I think on the basis that one, these things are quite complicated. Not everyone understands what lobbying really is. People don't understand who a senior figure is in the government or the SNP and why it matters that they've gone to work for a private firm. So in, in some ways it's just quite complicated and the public will struggle to follow that. But secondly, it's so easy for the Scottish government to just point to Westminster every time a question is asked. And because it's such a mess down there, and the cronyism is so much more blatant. Um, it, it allows the, the SNP to kind of mask some of the questions that we should be asking about the government. Thanks, Angela. Um, I mean, Kenny, what's your view on this? Um, I mean, do you think that the SNP government get away with it? Um, because, I mean, well, you're um, an MP and, and see, the, see the Tories on on a regular basis. So do you think that the SNP get away with some of this or do you think that that's just a normal part of politics? Well, I think some of these things are normal parts of politics, but I think there's issues in both. But I think there's a significant difference in degree. I think down south, I'd agree with what James has been saying, there's sleaze, there's a democracy. Equally, I have to say I'm despondent in some ways because I'm not sure that this is going to be terminal for the Tories. It's very much perhaps on the margins. It's a bit like Trump. Some people will just say, so what? We're voting for Boris anyway as people voted for Donald Trump. It does affect them. And, you know, it could certainly have an effect on the, uh, the local elections and indeed the Hartlepool by-election. And a bit like the nasty party, it's something that they will want to get rid of fast. So that is something deeply concerning. And indeed, I have to say in Westminster, what has concerned me as well is that almost a takeover, having sat in the Justice Committee, almost everybody coming for any unelected position has been a former Tory MP, a Tory supporter or a Tory donor. There is almost shamelessness about it, which leads me on to are there issues in Scotland? I think there are issues in Scotland, but the issue I find biggest in Scotland, I think there are issues that Charlotte Street Partners have to address because, you know, they do uh, have a, a profile and I think there has to be greater uh, openness there given their relationship with the government. But I actually have more concerns and I see more comparisons rather than between Scotland and London, but between to some extent Scotland and perhaps Dublin, you know, you have a smaller jurisdiction, you have a smaller population. I look back and very much regret that I failed uh, when I was a minister to actually break through in terms of the unelected state that we have, because we do have to have quangos, we do have to have civic Scotland. Equally, I'm very concerned that the king is dead, long live the king. 
people who I was complaining about being appointed to boards when Labour and the Liberal Democrats were in power are sitting on boards now. They've simply said, goodbye, Jack McConnell. Hello, Nicola Sturgeon. Now, I think, to be fair to the Scottish Government, they're very much welcome that they've got to 50-50 representation between men and women on boards. What we've failed to do is to get representation that reflects all of Scottish society in terms of poverty, in terms of poor. And I don't want to go on too much. I always remember trying as a minister, I'd focus too much on other things. But I would nominate, they'd say, is there anybody you want to nominate for a position such as the police board or whatever? And I would name this lady who was, as far as I was concerned, total state, in the local church in a very hard pressed community, ran a secondary, uh, ran a primary school, outstanding. And I would always get back from civil servants, or oh, she didn't fill in the form right, or she didn't do this. And then I would see others who I knew personally and thought they weren't in her league. And I think the difficulty is what we see is retired civil servants, retired people from business. We're not seeing people coming in from the trade unions other than the odd individual. We're not seeing people like my sainted uh, lady uh, who should be sitting on a board. And I think, you know, merited being on a board, they're still not getting in. So... I think in Scotland, it's not so much, you know, it's nowhere near the situation that we have down south, which I find very concerning and not yet on a par with America, but equally troubling. In Scotland, the problem is we have a small jurisdiction. Charlotte Street partners have a disproportionate influence. And equally, you're probably talking about 250 people in Scotland are sitting on boards, sometimes multiple boards. And we've got tens of thousands of people who probably should be represented because they're doing remarkable work in their communities never get anywhere near sitting on those boards. I mean, I think that there's two competing narratives about this, like this, the particulars of the, the Tory scandal. Um, one is which no one really cares, like it's not landing with the electorate. That seems to be like in the, the mainstream media, a big part of the, the narrative that they're running. But we also know that these types of scandals, even if they don't... Um, have a an instant impact on polling and things like that. It does erode trust in politicians, doesn't it? I mean, Angela, do you think that the the danger for this for the SNP and the Scottish government is that there have been a lot of scandals, um, and that that it has the effect of chipping away and you know eroding the trust in our politicians here over the longer term. I think. I think the public have already lost trust in politicians and that might explain quite a lot about some of the things that we see now that would never have been the case before. Um, it's it's not uncommon to see some sort of moral political scandal um, where there are no casualties really, like even, you know, breaking the ministerial code, you know, Pretty Patel did that, I think Matt Hancock and um, the, these are the kind of things that you would have stepped down for in some maybe not disgrace, but you would definitely by convention step, step down. They don't do that now, and the public don't seem to care. And it's almost as though the public have, have stopped actually holding politicians mm -hmm. to that standard. They don't expect it. They're not expecting politicians to be kind of up there, moral citizens and, and examples to everyone else. Yeah. Um, so I don't know why, you know, journalists, I think the problem that we're making <laughs> is that we are still trying to measure these things using all the old kinds of metrics what people would normally have resigned over and it doesn't apply anymore the public know what Boris Johnson is like and yet they voted for him working class people voted for him and they're not idiots they knew what they were voting for and I'm not sure that this is you know as Kenny said is, is going to be terminal for them and in Scotland well the, the, all the momentum that they he had in the 2015 general election remember when they just wiped Labour out um, I think people actually did think there might be a new type of more kind of radical honest politics on the way but I think the SNP has completely lost <laughs> that faith from people but yet they're still picking up the vote. Yeah. Yeah, well, Nicola, on this, um, you, you referenced Pretty Patel um, and breaking the ministerial code, and Nicola Sturgeon was confronted with um, her, the, her own allegations against her about um, breaking the ministerial code last night on that Channel 4 leaders debate. Um, you know, there was you know a question about you know the amount of Scottish sleaze, if you like, um, that, that was raised. But I mean, Kenny, I want to come to you on this because. It's not just a problem for the 
the first minister, it's the former first minister as well. Um, you know, according to a recent surveyion poll for the Sunday Post, Alex Salmond is a really unpopular politician, less popular than Boris Johnson. Do you think that the launch of the the new party has been overshadowed by Alex Salmond's um, personal reputation and ratings? No, I, I mean, I think, you know, it would be wrong to say that there hadn't probably been an effect for some individuals. But I think, you know, in terms of Alba's launch, I think there was a cry for the from the Yes movement. And I think Alba, certainly what I'm seeing is beginning to reflect those, you know, who have been in the Yes movement, sometimes also in the SNP and moving over. My worry is not so much, you know, any individual. Uh, that you, the, It's the damage to democracy uh, that is being done certainly down in Westminster, but, you know, it cascades down. People are now deeply, deeply sceptical of politics. We were talking before we came live here about, you know, <laughs> former days. They almost seem like hallowed days. People don't want to go into politics. Good people who previously you might have persuaded to come into politics are just going, no, I'm not becoming involved because my family life, you know, you know without... You know, uh, every sin or blemish will be looked at. The difficulty there is it then becomes a career structure when people who go into politics are people who want a political career. That is damaging for politics. So there is something that has to be done. There's not one simple solution. So I think, you know, it's democracy that's being undermined. In terms of Alba, I think, you know, we are comfortable there. In terms of Scotland, there's things we've got to do because we're heading in that direction. We can't get away with saying, you know, we're better than Westminster. We certainly are better than Westminster. It's shameless as well as shameful down there. But I think in Scotland, there is a pressure towards, you know, those coming in being those who almost want a career in politics and those who previously might have been persuaded to come into politics simply saying, I'm not going anywhere near it. And that is damaging. And we need to make sure that we can get these people in. I mean, I think another ma major factor in losing trust in politicians um, is when, you know, promises aren't kept. I think that there probably is a degree of frustration at the moment on, like, with regards to the SNP's position on the independence referendum. I think that people do feel like the, the referendum has been delayed. But, I mean, I do think that for some people in, in Alaba, the, the issue of, um, Salmond been minus sixty four percent in the in the in the ratings poll. Johnson's on minus forty two, and Anna Sarwar's on seven percent. I mean, I think that 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 would be a concern for me um, if if I was a if I was a member of that organisation. Well, uh, I think that's something that we'll just have to address. I mean, I think you know at the end of the day, the media has uh, you know been prejudicial towards Alex Hammond, if I can put it that way. I think we saw that, whether it was in Kirsty Watts' programme or anything else. The media almost seemed deeply disappointed that the jury didn't come to the verdict that they prepared for. And I know that myself, having been interviewed by several journalists and indeed, you know, the TV cameras lining up that then disappeared because uh, the outcome wasn't what they had prepared for. Uh, so these are challenges that Alba has to accept, but we do. And equally, we're conscious that, as I say, our purpose here is to deliver the desire, I think, for the yes movement to see Scotland move. And indeed, you know, my own particular view is we have got to do, move now because this is our best possible opportunity. And if we don't take it now, then the challenges coming down the road in terms of Brexit being resolved and constitutional change becoming too risky of uh, the attacks upon the democratic powers in, we in Holyrood by Westminster, all of these challenges, never mind rising unemployment and increased austerity, are going to make constitutional change very, very hard to sell to a deeply depressed and demoralised people. I mean, I, I'm just, Angela, I'm going to bring you in quickly on this, um, but we've only got another few minutes on this topic, but I saw that you indicate that you wanted to come in on this. Yeah, I mean, I, I, I do uh, believe that to some extent that the concept of identity politics can, can be inadvertently divisive in the wrong way where we start to become so obsessed with what defines us that we actually just sort of separate ourselves from people we should be in solidarity with. However, I do think that, that there, we do have to make sure that we are paying attention to um, identities and 
the thing about Alaba, uh, Kenny, is I mean, you you have a candidate who uh, is it the boxer, the Alex Arthur, as it his name is, um, and he had been found to make some really deeply troubling comments about the the Gypsy Traveller community, and we've had Alex Salmond, who yes, he's been cleared of any criminal charges, but he did apologise. Um, to one of the complainers of the sexual harassment allegations at one point. Um, at the, the Alaba Women's Conference, a claim was made that, that Stonewall Scotland and LGBT youth were actually signed up to some secret plan to lower the age of consent to, uh, you know, something ridiculous like 12 or 8 or something. And it was completely untrue. Now, these are groups, women, gypsy travellers, ethnic minorities, the LGBT community, that need to be welcome and safe in an independent Scotland, should we get there. Alaba is not is not representing that. And to fall back on the idea that this is about getting people into politics who would normally never get there and that the working class are just a little bit rough and ready, I don't subscribe to that. I, I'm working class, grew up working class and was brought up with those val values of solidarity. They were core to us. And I hate that excuse of, it's just because it's not the careerist types and they're a bit rough around the edges. Those kind of views and that kind of behaviour, that needs to be called out. Can and I yet after that was highlighted about the Gypsy Traveller comments, nothing was done to take that candidacy away from, from that individual. Alaba went with him anyway. I mean, what, what do you say to that? Angela, I do want to bring Kenny back in on this because I think that there was a poll this week that... Um, I think it might have been panel based that put um, Alabama potentially eight seats. I mean, is that Kenny? Is that is that your prediction? And um, what about these it, various issues um, well, that Angela's raised? I think we are going to do well. I think that's the base, not the uh, predictions that we're uh, doomed before we started. And I think we're going to do better as the final campaigning takes off. In terms of individuals, Alec Arthur has apologised for his tweet and has been retracted. Uh, equally, as I say, I think there's been a focusing in on that. Uh, and I think grossly unfair. Uh, I think Alba is putting forward the chance to you know, drive forward on, uh, drive Scotland onwards. You know, and I think this suggestion of, uh, you know, somehow or other, you know, Alba is full of all these depraved people is just absolute nonsense. That's why, you know, you have a, you had a women's conference that was remarkably well attended that has come forward, I believe, a radical position that's very much appreciated, which is five for women in Scotland. They've given it, you know, five star rating. So as I say, every party has issues. Let him without sin, because, you know, I think all of us have probably done things, said things, tweeted things that we rather wouldn't. So, you know, that has been addressed by the individuals involved and we should move on from that. And I just think that you know, many in the mainstream media are simply focusing disproportionately upon Alba and they do so for one particular reason, because they fear Alba because they're representing the British establishment. That's why going back to what you know Angela was saying, that what was put forward about Alex Salmond the week before in various Sunday newspapers was utterly disgraceful. Meanwhile, other people find themselves pursued by Police Scotland in the directions of the Crown Office in Scotland. Uh, there certainly seems to be uh, one law for those that represent the British establishment or are prepared to cozy up to it and those who challenge it. I'm gonna I'm gonna move this on now um, because I want to I want to bring James on and I really think that it's important that we do get onto a discussion about the broader foreign policy issues um, within the SNP within the independence movement and uh, within within the election. So I want to just um, move on to the the question of Trident as I referred to in the opening remarks to the show. Um, on Monday, Admiral John Gower, who was a rear admiral in the British Navy since 2014, said that um, Scottish independence could mean that Trident nuclear weapons would have to be moved to France or even the US because there are no alternative ports in the UK that could house them. That is unless um, an independent Scottish government makes a lease agreement with the UK to allow Trident to remain housed at Faz Lane. Now, this is something that has come up before in the media, um, the idea of Trident being used as some kind of bargaining chip. I think with regards to the, the independence movement, for many supporters of Scottish independence, unilateral disarmament has always been a big part of the moral case 
for Scottish independence. So, James, I'm going to come to you because you've um, you've been involved in a lot of anti trident campaigns. Can you imagine a scenario in which Scotland becomes independent and actually keeps trident? I mean, unfortunately, yes, I can. Um, there seems to be this sort of assumption that because people in Scotland don't want Trident, which I think will be backed up by opinion polls, that because the ruling party um, doesn't want um, Trident, um, that therefore we will have the moral mandate and therefore everything will prevail exactly as we um, would like to see. In reality, um, NATO is a nuclear armed alliance. Um, I think John Gower's uh, report now it's got many of the biases that you would attach to an establishment figure and so on. But it does make clear the central dilemma that like applying to join a nuclear armed organization uh, of the Western Alliance, essentially, while also having a political agenda of denuclearization is a very difficult and uh, fraught thing to do. And in terms of what you said about moving it, he also makes very clear the other communities are very unlikely to welcome the prospect of having some nuclear weapons just kind of like moved in next door. Therefore, there's likely to be endless planning up, uh, objections. There's likely to be protests, as we would ourselves, of course, uh, host at Faz Lane and so on. Um, and essentially, it's not just so easy to say, oh, well, Scotland doesn't like it. Uh, they want to join NATO, but we'll have a nice negotiation and therefore it's going to be moved because where is it actually going to be moved to uh, that's not going to be met with a series of objections. So, I mean, I think for all the moral force of our own conviction, and I do genuinely believe this about people in the Yes movement, that they do want to be rid of Trident. And I even believe it of Nicola Sturgeon and to a lesser extent, the majority of the uh, the people in the SNP parliamentary cohort, that they genuinely do have um, a moral conviction around this. But that doesn't mean to say it's actually going to prevail when geopolitical realities start to intrude. Um, and unfortunately, um, as with the European question, I think there's too much emphasis on goodwill, as in if we want free trade, therefore it will happen. And not enough realism about the real forces that might be involved. And remember, we don't have to join NATO. Right? It is a choice to join NATO. And we would have to apply to join NATO, and therefore we would have to enter a negotiation. And their negotiating stance will be you have to keep nuclear weapons. Of course it will, because ultimately that's what NATO is about. But Angela, um, what, do, what do you think? Do you think that the SNP would slide on this kind of issue? It's, I think it is one of the things that is spoken a lot about within the broader Yes movement. Um, I remember 2014, you had a lot of like Bairns Not Bombs, you had mobilisations with Scottish CND um, at the, the base at Fans Lane. Is this something that the, the SNP would slide on? I think they, I think they could actually, be, and and I'll, I'll explain why. Um, see, when you know independence is like a kind of a just an idea, something that you don't really believe is going to happen. You just can't see it coming. You know, it's quite easy then to have really really strong moral standpoints on things like nuclear weapons. But when we get to a point where something like that is becoming a reality, um. I think it can become easier to make the argument to the public that these kinds of partnerships are all about, you know, they're all part of being a mature, modern country in the world, allies with the big boys, look how seriously Scotland's being taken. Um, and so I, I think that there are ways to spin it. And let's re remember, you know, the the the. the anti-nuclear weapons stance in the independence movement has been very, very strong. Um, but I would say that, you know, as independence, as support for independence grows, you're then pulling in people with a lot of other different ideas and views and things that they might feel more strongly about and they might feel less strongly about this. It might not be the deal breaker for them, basically. So I think it's possible that you could spin an argument for it. And if that was going to, uh, you know, help the SNP deliver the dream of independence, 
then I think it's quite possible to entertain the idea that they could do that. Kenny, one of your uh, fellow Scottish MPs, Stuart MacDonald, um, said recently that we should, uh, Scotland should consider a um, multilateral approach to disarmament. What, what would you, what would be your view to the MOD if they wanted to come to some kind of lease agreement um, on Trident, um, keeping nuclear weapons in an independent Scotland? What's your view on it? Well, I think that's non-negotiable. I mean, I think, first of all, you know, as you said, the rise of the early SNP and the nationalist movement in Scotland was synonymous with unilateralism. You know, as the SNP was taking off, so were demonstrations at the Holy Lock before it turned into Faz Lane. Uh, secondly, I think there is neither an economic, moral, nor a military case for Trident. And indeed, I actually think that rather than the Scottish government, whoever they may be, I don't think the, S I think the SNP membership... Uh, is still overwhelmingly opposed to uh, Trident. And I think Stuart MacDonald is out of kilter with the members of the SNP, but I'm no longer in that party to speak to. I think there's more chance with Scottish independence that common sense would prevail south of the border. The UK cannot afford Trident. It cannot afford Trident economically without increased austerity. And you've got a military leadership now, not, you know, the odd retired general, but the military leadership that actually says this is not what we need. Uh, it has simply been an expose of British power. So actually, I think Scottish independence, you know, results in what George Osborne feared, which is why the British establishment oppose it, because Britain then has to come, or the rest of the UK has to come to terms of being a second or even third rate power. That would perhaps be the trigger that recognises that actually maybe the need in England is to look after the people, boost the economy, and actually make sure that the soldiers, sailors and airmen we do have actually have kit that's fit and proper. So when we do ever have a situation stout as Iraq, it's not a Trident missile that's sitting, gathering, you know, rust or whatever. You actually can send your soldiers in properly equipped as opposed to soldiers who went into Afghanistan unequipped. So actually, rather than think the Scottish government coming out, I think Scottish independence would probably result in a bit more common sense south of the border, because this is driven by Brexit, post-Brexit, post-imperial post prestige. You know, I think if you got the British military establishment round the table and asked them privately, and they even say it publicly, where do you want the money and resource spent? They would say it's not on trying that we want it spent. We want it spent in conventional weapon and equally the threat we face in the world today is actually terrorism. And in fact, we need to invest more in intelligence and other facilities to do with that. So as I say, I actually think rather than backsliding by Scottish, Scotland, independence might result in some common sense at last beginning to prevail south of the border. Exactly the same as I think independence for Scotland would be good for England. You know, a country that only 40% of people vote for the likes of Boris Johnson, we might actually get some democracy and people would realise that actually... England isn't Boris Johnson and his cronies. It's actually a very pleasant pace with good people. It's just run by a kleptocracy at the moment. Um, James, I'm going to come back to you on that because you you were straight um, in mentioning NATO, which is obviously a core part of this discussion. Um, and it does get an important mention in Admiral Gower's report. Um, the British government said since 1962 that its nuclear weapons are part of the British contribution to the Western military alliance. And NATO's General Secretary, Jen Stolenberg, said that an independent Scotland joining the nuclear alliance NATO on a political non-nuclear platform would be at best exceedingly difficult. And I think that some of the issues around this conversation, you know, it sometimes can feel quite abstract. Um, you know, what what is NATO? We've had some comments coming in from people saying, "Don't we need to be a member in order to keep us uh, keep us safe?" Um, so, how how would you see NATO um, as a in twenty twenty one? I don't think NATO itself has a very good answer to that question, and I'll come on to that in a second. But. Um, Obviously, NATO originates um, in the Cold War, um, and as one of the comments said, the NA does stand for North Atlantic, that's correct. Um, and essentially, uh, it was an anti-communist neutral defence uh, organisation. Without dwelling too much on that phase of its history, 
essentially after the Soviet Union collapsed, um, NATO has been an alliance of uh, mostly Western states um, that has engaged in various uh, campaigns of projection of American power, firstly in the Balkans and laterally in Afghanistan um, and Libya. It's supposed to be doing a number of things, um, first of which is anti-terrorism. Now, if you look at its record in Libya and Afghanistan, you can probably see that it's probably caused more terrorism than it's prevented in some regards. And the other thing, of course, um, and this is the politically contentious bit, is essentially encircling and keeping down Russia um, and also having some sort of role in and around China, although that's probably a little bit less defined. But Russia is probably uh, the central uh, fixation and focus in terms of the argument for having the continuing military alliance. Having said that, it's a massively controversial issue. As I said, NATO doesn't quite know what it's for. Obviously, Donald Trump was of the view that uh, America should be rid of it, despite the fact that most of us, I think, would argue correctly that NATO is a projection of American power. But Trump was one of the more introverted America and therefore doesn't want NATO. And more recently, you had uh, Emmanuel Macron saying NATO is brain dead, um, partly because it's uh, so focused on uh, conflict with Russia that it's just basically making all of the issues with Russia internally worse, which has generally been the record of the West in relation to Russia uh, since the end of the Cold War. We imposed terrible free market reforms that caused the biggest peacetime collapse uh, in an economy ever registered in Russia. And the encirclement that we've done has only f inflamed uh, Russian nationalism. Um, so I think Macron's point has been essentially that we need to rethink uh, what type of relationships we're trying to project through NATO. And although I would generally not agree with Macron on many, many issues, uh, particularly his free market reforms and so on, where I would agree with him is I think NATO is brain dead um, and it doesn't really have a clear function. And uh, above all, in relation to Scotland, it commits us to a level of military spending which would essentially be compatible to what we're currently spending at the moment on Trident and our whole military um, system in the United Kingdom anyway. And if we're making the argument we want to spend less on bombs and more on public services or bairns or whatever you want to put it, uh, then NATO is going to be a limitation to that too. Thanks, James. Now, Kenny, um, the, the, the NATO U-turn um, in the SNP was one of the, it was one of the opening moves um, by the SNP just after the referendum was called um, and you were obviously involved in that um, policy decision. Um, how, how significant do you think that that moment was um, within the SNP and the wider movement? I don't think it was of huge significance. It was, you know, it was part of a positioning for a referendum then, you know, but the world has changed at that stage. You know, you were arguing about retention, you know, that the only change that was going to happen was that the Scottish Parliament would decide, you know, all the major matters. We were going to retain the Queen, we were going to retain the currency of Sterling, we were going to remain in the EU, there would be no hard border, there'd be no border of any sort as such, and we would just simply remain in NATO. I think there was good reason and logical reason for that, but the world has moved on. We're now out with the EU, which is why the position has to change. Coronavirus has shown why you need to have your currency uh, and your own central bank. And indeed, as I say, I think James has correctly said that, you know, NATO has moved on. At one stage, it was primarily formed to keep America in Europe. Now it's not quite sure what its role is. It certainly became, I think, uh, a key situation of getting boots on the ground at, at one stage, ending under Obama, but continuing under... So where we go, I don't know. Alaba doesn't have a position as yet on NATO. That's something we'll require to come to. All I can say, I think, is the position is... First of all, an independent Scotland has to, first of all, reassure its friends. And that includes the rest of the UK, but it also includes countries such as Norway. We have to make sure that we make it clear to them that we will support them. We will not be a backdoor that would trouble them. Uh, that doesn't mean you have to accept nuclear weapons. It does mean that you have to show a willingness to support their cause. And I know how concerned Norway is, for example, about Scotland's position. They are not opposed to Scottish independence, but they are, first of all, there to defend you know, the security of Norway. And equally, we have to protect our friends south of the border. 
That doesn't necessarily mean NATO membership. There are issues in NATO membership. You can, as Norway is, be non-nuclear and within NATO. There is, though, obviously the crime and extremists and in crisis, the nuclear weapons can be put on board. But certainly the Norwegian position would allow for the removal of Trident, even if some military leaders wouldn't like it. I think far harder is the position of the 2%. I think uh, an independent Scottish government's first priority is going to be shoring up and building the economy as well as tackling poverty and inequality. Two uh, percent, although to be fair, other than the United States, you know, very few countries in the NATO alliance have come anywhere near that, which was one of Trump's uh, complaints. So I think there's something that uh, has to be considered. Alma doesn't have a position on it, but I think we've moved on from 2014. So I would have to say that whether they would the position necessarily be reflective of what the SNP took back in 2013, uh, I have to say I don't think so. Although I do think what we would have to do is to emphasise that our support uh, for maintaining uh, friend relationships and ensuring that we don't undermine the security of others such as NATO, uh, such as Norway and the rest of the U, the rest of the UK. That can be dealt with in a non-nuclear basis and indeed by removing Trident. So I think removing Trident is non-negotiable. Membership of NATO, that's something you'll have to consider. ALBA will consider an independent Scotland will have to consider. But I think it's a vastly different situation from 2014. And we might very well find that as with currency, as with the EU, NATO is also a changed position for the Yes movement come the next uh, uh, push forward. I mean, I think that I would want to, to say that I think for me anyway, it was a, quite a significant moment that that you turn. I wish that Jean was was here to to join to join us and, and give her take on that because it was quite a significant moment for for Jean and also uh, John Finney, who also resigned over the the change in the policy position. Um, and amongst um, some of the the pro independence left in Scotland that is looked upon um, as the SNP's clause four moment and um, you know a real change in direction for the party and um, that the obviously um, you I know you've compared the Sturgeon to, to Blairism and the new SNP and the old SNP but the the U-turn on NATO was a very significant moment for a lot of um, particularly younger activists who'd been involved in the anti-war movement against the war in Iraq and um, so I'm just gonna um, I want to bring in James on this because you were obviously involved in that that movement as well now in terms of international policy does joining NATO as an independent country send any kind of positive message to our friends um, abroad? It depends how you define your friends, of course. Like, I mean, for me, internationalism has always tended to mean, um, and I don't want to sound like I'm some great moralist or something, but internationalism has always tended to mean solidarity with uh, the Kurdish people and the Palestinian people and so on and so forth. Now, if you consider the membership of uh, Turkey uh, and the... Uh, in the NATO alliance uh, and the fact that they were able to uh, get away with what they were able to get away with in northern Syria recently and so on. Um, clearly there is an extent to which NATO cannot control its own members from engaging in some quite abhorrent uh, military interventions and repressive policies and so on um, and doesn't always factor in the question of the rights of the most oppressed people. Um, I've also seen sadly that there has been, I believe, amongst perhaps the younger cohort of parliamentarians, a softening in relation to the politics of Palestine and Israel, which I think does reflect um, Kenny's distinction. Uh, which I also, which I do accept between uh, the new and the old SNP. Now it's been changes of nuance, um, but nonetheless, I think that there is a less definitively um, pro-Palestinian perspective that I've seen um, from some of what you might call the more Atlanticist leaning elements of the younger parliamentary cohort, and um, particularly you've mentioned Stuart Macdonald and so on inside the uh, SNP. And that's worrying in general because what we end up with is setting precedence uh, very early on in terms of the country that we would like to be. It's going to become all the harder 
to, to show solidarity with oppressed people, to get rid of Trident and all these other things when the going gets tough. If we're already selling these causes down the river um, at this stage or softening our stances or trying to appear more modern or more enlightened in relation to American power and all these other things, what's it going to be like when we're actually dealing with the challenges of independence? That's my great worry about this and particularly about the NATO stance. Well, thanks for that, James. Well, I'm just going to come to you last. Last words, Angela. Um, what 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 do you? Th there was a question there that come up came up from one of the the viewers saying, "Wouldn't an independent Scotland be better off having a position of neutrality? What would you like to see an independent Scotland behave like as a you know a member of like?" global citizenry or like how would you how would you like to see an independent scotland develop its foreign policy what should the priorities be well i would love to live in a, an independent uh, scotland that was uh, pursuing peace and against nuclear weapons and didn't get involved in wars and didn't need an army and uh, and and just focused on foreign aid and developing the rest of the world wouldn't we all love to live in that kind of world and this is kind of the crux of it for me about the independence movement we need to you know if okay if, if people in the indie movement are opposed to nato they're opposed to trident they're opposed to foreign interventions military interventions what kind of military do you see an independent Scotland having then? What is our place? And that conversation is one that we don't really have. Everyone's a bit uncomfortable with it. It's kind of like the, the uh, you know, with Brexit and immigration. You know, the left was so incensed at the right for being able to make immigration an issue that it just didn't want to talk about it. It didn't want to talk about having a policy or a framework or anything. It just didn't want the discussion. And that, you know, if you don't offer people something, then they're going to vote for the other thing. So if the independence movement doesn't come up with some vision, and then, you know, the high Hegeans are turning up and saying, well, we could be pals with NATO, we could do a deal on Trident. If you're not offering something else that looks feasible and realistic, people will probably go with that. So we need to, I think, be willing to have the difficult discussions about military, uh, about foreign policy, and about uh, you know, that, that that question, you know, do uh, be involved in war? Like, you know, these are the things that we like to think that we you know, nobody wants to talk about, particularly in the left. But we need to decide what is Scotland going to look like. Mm. Thanks very much, Angela, and thanks um, to my my guests, and thanks to the audience for joining us today. And um, we we are out of time. Um, I think we've covered a phenomenal amount of ground tonight. Um, and you can tune in every week at the same time until the election, um, which is just one episode to go, and then we'll have a follow up episode to do a bit of post match analysis. We'd like to take this opportunity just at the end of the show to thank Independence Live for their technical support and hosting the show because without them, this just wouldn't have been possible. Um, you can keep up to date with the show and many more things that Contour are doing on our YouTube channel. Um, you can keep up to date with all of the shows that Independence Live have by going on to their YouTube channel and subscribing or visiting their website at independencelive.net. Finally, I just want to say thank you very much to our guests for being part of the discussion today. Um, if you'd like to keep up with our guests, um, both Kenny and Angela are easy to find on Twitter. And James Foley, as I said in my introduction, writes a daily newsletter for Source Direct, which you can sign up to um, on the Source Direct website. Now, finally, Contour tries to bring you some of the best guests and insights into the Scottish election, but we aren't funded by millionaires and we don't have big Tory donors to help us out. If you can afford it, please support Contour with a monthly donation. You can do that and view a lot more of our content at contour.co.uk. Thank you all and good night until next week.